Welcome to the New York Institute for the Humanities podcast. I'm Robert Boynton. In this week's episode from The Vault, we revisit a 2013 presentation by the Yale historian Timothy Snyder about the book he wrote with historian Tony Judd. Judd was diagnosed with ALS in 2008 and died in 2010. He spent those two last years writing books and lecturing, as well as holding weekly conversations with Snyder. The result was Thinking the 20th Century, which was published in 2012. I'm Jennifer Holmans. I was married to Tony, as most of you here know. Um, and I'm very honored to be here to introduce Tim to you. But I want to say something about Tony's illness. The illness, I have learned, creates silences. It creates awkwardnesses and gaps in conversation. People are afraid they'll say the wrong thing, or they'll say it the wrong way, or at the wrong time. They want to help, and they worry that they will offend, so they say nothing, or they hold back, and there's a kind of silence. Or, and this drove Tony nuts, they say things very loudly. (laughs) When Tony had been ill for some time, and he was already quadriplegic in a wheelchair, he delivered an hour and a half lecture on social democracy for several hundred people at Skirball. Afterwards, a woman came up to him. She had a question, and she started shouting her question at him, as if he was hard of hearing, or as if because his body didn't work, she somehow wouldn't be able to get through. He was enraged, and he said, Madam, I can hear you perfectly well. She was then stunned and embarrassed, and the conversation ended. Another silence. Tony actually had a whole folder on his computer full of examples of these kinds of disconnect, which he was going to put into a book someday, and he called it in his sort of black humor, irreverent way, my diseased book. Only the people closest to the person who is sick forget, I think, at times, the sickness itself. But then, often, the sick person gets angry. And when that's Tony, it's not a good thing. (laughs) And he would say, can't you see I'm ill? And there would be more silence. So the reason I'm saying all of this is because this book, Thinking the 20th Century, stands for the art and practice of conversation, of breaking silences and talking together. And that's one of the reasons why I think what Tony and Tim did in this book is important. It's a conversation a healthy, civil, engaged conversation. For once, and to Tim and Tony's great credit, there were no silences. Now, of course, today, Tony's not here to uphold his end of the conversation, but we are. So when Tim has told us about the book and its ideas, I would just say to you, please, no silences, no fears of offending Tony's memory, or me, or Tim, or the book, or the man who was so ill. If we're going to do this in Tony's spirit, we better just cut to the core, say what we really think, and get this, whatever this happens to be at the time, right. So before I introduce him, I just want to thank him for all of the enormous work that he did on this book, and it was a lot of work, and for carrying the torch now, for continuing the conversation and by the way, if you haven't seen his response to Fukuyama in the New York Times book review, I urge you to take a look. There's no silences there. <laughs> um, but above all, in this instance, he's a man who understands the value and importance of an age-old art, the art of conversation. To be nice. What Jennifer has done is, is to begin with the impossible question, which is why are some of us here and why are some of us not here? You know the answer to that question now. I want to say a word about the relationship between that, between that absence, between that, what I hope, um, in, in the spirit of what Jennifer has just said, that absence rather than that silence, how that relates to the book itself, because of course it does. The book arose from the knowledge of Tony's illness. Uh, The book arose because I understood that Tony couldn't use his hands and arms. When I understood that Tony couldn't use his hands and arms, 
on that day, I proposed that we talk this book together. Not knowing what I was going to get into, I tend to think the best moral decisions you make in life are the ones, the difficulty of which you do not realize <laughs> in advance. You know, that applies to marriage and children and learning languages and writing books and pretty much anything of significance. It arose from my very limited awareness of what this disease meant. It takes on a form, like all art does, which is a result of, of limitations, right? It's, it, it arose from a certain limitation, which was that Tony could not physically write, and so I proposed that we talk together. Now, I did this straight from this moment of empathy, but of course I also did it because I appreciated who Tony was. There was an aesthetic sense to this. There was a sense that Tony's was an irreplaceable mind, that as much should come from this mind as possible in the time that we have. The image that was in my mind at the time was of a national park. If you care about Bryce or Zion National Park or the Grand Canyon, you knew that one day they would just be filled with mercury or fracked or something terrible was going to happen to them. You would go and you would chart them and you would try to explore all the things you know about them. You get as much out of it as you possibly could. I was thinking about it in that way, as something beautiful and vast and only partly known and irreplaceable. And then there was also, for me, there's curiosity as well. There were things that I was interested in about Tony. I wouldn't have started walking through this park, um, which is an image which appears again at the end of the book, if I hadn't had things I wanted to find out myself. Obviously, this was very interesting for me, not just because of what I knew about Tony, but because I wanted to figure out about Tony. Like, how do you get better? which is something that many of us fail to do, right? How do you get better? Tony got better. He got better. He was a better historian at the end than he was at the beginning. He was also a better essayist at the end than he was at the beginning. And I was interested in how that came to be. And more broadly, I was interested in the question of which Tony is an important instance, but he's not the only instance. And it's an absurdly, ambitiously broad question, but how is it that experience affects what we think? How is it that history gets in, in the case of historians, how is it that history gets inside a man, and then how is it that it comes back out again? And all, I, all we had now was Tony's mind. We didn't have the books he was going to read or the books that I was going to read, because for different reasons, neither of us would read any books at this time. All we had was what was already in Tony's mind. And so I, we could we can carry out a kind of experiment of how it got there, but also how it could come out again, right? Could it come out again in conversation in such a way that it would be worthwhile making a book out of it? We shared a certain other little something, which is a little bit exotic, um, which is the form of this book, which is a very East European form, as some of you will know. Also a French form of talking in book. And there's even a Polish word for this, which is interview river. It's so prominent in Polish, this form, that sometimes people write books, and then they put them into conversational okay. forms so that, it, <laughs> so, that it, so that it looks better. The East European things we shared were very important. I'm going to try to give you a sense why in a moment. But this form was something we had in common. Tony in one of his many midlife achievements, and what was part of what I see as a very important midlife turn, learned Czech, which isn't easy, especially not easy when you're 40. The first book he read from Czech, in Czech from beginning to end were Karl Chopek's Conversations with Masaryk, right? So the, one of the most outstanding Czech writers speaking to the Czech, Czechoslovak philosopher president in the late 1930s. One of the books that brought me into East European history was Czesław Miłosz's uh, interviews with Alexander Bott, two Polish poets, avant-garde poets in different generations, talking about the 20th century. One of the best books about Eastern Europe. It's called, the English translation is called My Century. So I had this idea, I had this tradition, I had this notion, or rather just this presumption that you could do something like this and that it would work out. Which isn't to say that I saw us in these roles or I made Tony recite poetry or anything like that. It just means that it, I took for granted that something like this could work. We talked together for, for half a year, more or less every Thursday. But what we had was Tony's mind. Tony's mind became not only our subject and our way of communicating, it was also a way of understanding how important the body is for sociability, just to lightly suggest something that Jennifer has already talked about, how important it is to be able to answer the door yourself, how important it is to be able to shake hands, how important it is to be able to displace yourself in the right ways at the right times. All of those things Tony was trying to compensate for. And all of those things, in some sense, weren't that important to me. In almost every way, this is harder than it sounds, but in one way it was easier than it sounds, and that is that we were always able to talk to each other. And the way we talked to each other wasn't any different now than it had been before, except that it was more regular, which as far as I was concerned was all to the good, because it, it meant that I had access to something once a week, which I had access to once a year before all of that. 
What we did was, I asked him questions. There were three kinds of questions. There were the questions that I was concerned about, which is where we started. How do you become who you are? How do you get from being a working class kid in South London to being Tony Judd? How do you learn from your mistakes, or how do you learn from getting things right? Then there were the things that Tony was preoccupied with. There was the book that Tony wanted to write, which was called Modern Republic of Letters, which he already had outlined, and, and the outline of which he gave to me at a certain point. And we talked through that as well. Then there were the things which his, which his other friends, or our mutual friends, wanted to know about, which were the purely biographical questions. Not my instrumental ones of how you become better, but what was it like to be a Jewish kid in London in the 50s and 60s? What was it like to be at the Ecole Normale in the late 60s? What was it like? What was it like? What was it like? And so we did that as well. And there were, so there were three kinds of questions, and these three kinds of questions generated more than a million words, and those of you who write know what that means. And from those million words, we edited together chapters down right to the end. When we started this, the idea was we're going to talk for a while, and then Snyder's going to make something of it after Judd is dead. That was the idea. What actually happened was we talked for a long while, a much longer while, I think, than either of us expected. And then we worked on it together all the way to the end, all the way to the very end. In the meantime, Tony wrote 200 books. So what sort of book does this create? If I had to give a phrase to it, I would say this is something like an interactive history of political ideas. Interactive in the sense that it's not just about ideas, it's about intellectuals in politics, right? How intellectuals make their way into politics and how politics make their way into intellectuals. It's interactive in the sense that it's about the interaction between life and work. It's about the relationship between what you experience and how you think. Not in any simplifying way, not in a stupid way, like Tony is a Jew and therefore thinks about Zionism, or he's English and therefore he thinks about England. What I take to be an interesting way, that is how you process and overcome and exploit, confront or not confront the things that made you who you are as you learn how to become a better thinker. It's interactive also in a more obvious way that it's interactive between Tony and me. So the form that this book takes is not Oh, Tony, you have such wonderful thoughts about Sasha. Can you please tell me your wonderful thoughts about Sasha yet again? Because I couldn't get enough of reading Past and Perfect. It doesn't take that form at all. It takes the form of an argument, a kind, disciplined, civilized, friendly, and I think very often loving argument, but nevertheless an argument in the sense of, in the old sense of the word, right? A contest of ideas where I know what Tony thinks, and I'm tr sometimes I'm trying to extract it but I don't always agree with them. Um, very often I don't. And that is the way in which this book becomes, I think, different from what Modern Republic of Letters would have been. I miss Modern Republic of Letters. I also miss Locomotion, the book about trains he also wanted to write. And of course, I thought about that book every Thursday morning when I took the train down here, because without trains, I, this book wouldn't have happened, which confirms one of Tony's basic theses, which is that public transportation is necessary for civil society. If I had had to drive to downtown New York from New Haven, I couldn't have done it, right? And I think in some ways this book is better because I think I got things out of Tony that wouldn't have come out of Tony all by themselves. The other way that's interactive is, I hope, between itself and, and the reader. It reads more accessibly than its content would suggest. It's about difficult ideas. The fact that it's conversational means that there are all these interstices into which people can insert themselves. There are easy way, places to pause and think. I think, I think so far it's, it has given this impression, I hoped it would give, that it's a conversation that in some sense you can join, precisely because it's a conversation. You can stick yourself in it. So what then are the subjects? The subjects are things like the Holocaust as a Jewish and German question. That's where we start. The English and French exceptionalism, Marxism, fascism, anti-fascism, communism, liberalism, planning, history, and intellectual life as, as, as vocations. Let me read you a section, if, if you'll permit me, about the very first thing, because this gives you a sense of how Tony and I interacted, but also what the questions were which were animating me. Let me just take a step back. So some of you have read Bloodlands, probably, or at least know what it is or have some idea of it. That book is, among other things, an answer to post-war, right? So it's an argument against post-war. So post-war, I think, is, is, a, is superior and probably unsurpassable for what it is, but... I also thought, 
you can't really write about Europe starting in the post-war. You have to have the catastrophe fully understood some in there. And the catastrophe is what Bloodlands is about. So there's a reason why both post-war and Bloodlands are neologisms. There's a reason why they're similar length. And there's a reason why we're arguing about some of the things we're arguing about towards this general attempt to get the Jewish question, the Holocaust, and this larger catastrophe in European history rather than outside of it. Here's an example of that. We've already been talking about Freud. Tim, this is me. Let me use a Freudian term to ask about something that I see as a displacement in your own work, or about the great rupture in the history of the century, the Holocaust. The title of your history of Europe is post-war, which is itself, of course, a claim about a new quality. But beginning your book in 1945 allows you not to write about the mass murder of the Jews. And indeed, very little of your historical work poses Jewish questions, even when they are there to be posed. And so my question is, when, if it has happened at all, did what we call now the Holocaust start to inform the way that you personally were thinking about history? Tony. As I mentioned earlier, I was unusually well informed on the subject for a 10 year old child. He's referring to the conversations we had about his father, his father's cousin who was murdered at Auschwitz, the relatives in London, the boys he grew up with who were a little bit older than him who were survivors of Auschwitz. And yet, as a student at Cambridge University in the 1960s, I have to confess that I was remarkably uninterested in the subject, not only the Holocaust, but Jewish history in general. Moreover, I don't believe that I was in the least taken aback when we studied, for example, the history of occupied France without any reference to the expulsion of the Jews. This is one of the subjects we were, which we were then, with, that's the beginning of the book, which we're then going to pursue throughout the book. That is why this might be, but also how it might be remedied. So both the intellectual biography and also how intellectual biography turns back upon itself and becomes learning. Because one of the things which Tony wanted to do in modern Republic of Letters, which he hadn't actually done before, is put Jewish thought and Jewish experience in the center of a history of Europe. That gives you, I hope, a sense of what the book is about. The way the chapters work is that each theme, each substantive theme of the chapter is introduced by a bit of Tony's biography that corresponds to it. So when the chapter about Zionism is introduced by his experience as a Zionist, the chapter about English exceptionalism is introduced by his English education. The chapter about Marxism is introduced by his experience growing up in a Marxist family. The idea, of course, not being that you understand one just by reference to the other. The idea being that this is an experience which I tried to extract from Tony in as clear and as true a way as possible from which we can figure out how Tony got to where he got. And by the way, the biography was not that easy to extract. I'm completely absent from the biographical sections. I remove my questions completely because it would be ridiculous for me to say, how do you spell the shuttle where your mother was from over and over and over again? The biography part is just written in Tony's prose. But it took an awful lot of work to get it out. This is not something that Tony was actually that interested at first in talking about. This was my project and the project of other people to do this. Some people thought it was interesting for its own sake, and it certainly is. But what I was interested in was how the biography then becomes something from which you learn, out of which you learn, how you become better than yourself you were before. And that, by the way, is why there are these personal details in it, the kinds of things which people pull out and think, ah, oh, that's interesting, that's, that's striking. The reason why there's so much personal detail is that without the personal detail, you can't possibly have a sense of the crises, the turning points, and so on, that make a thinker who he was. Let me try to give you an example of how this kind of argument would work. The book heads toward a kind of collision. It's a collision which you could think of as Tony's midlife crisis. Many men have midlife crises. The question is what you do with them. Do you buy a car, et cetera, et cetera. In Tony's case, what we have is a midlife crisis, I think, in which he embraces another biography. Tony was born in 1948 in London. He takes part in the revolution of 1968 in Britain and in France. He identifies to some extent with its ideals. Later in life, in the 80s, he begins to identify with the other revolutions in 1968, the ones in Prague and in Warsaw. And the interesting thing about this is that it's not simply intellectual. I think it creates a second biographical line for him. Because, of course, if you, as I have, have read about the Warsaw Ghetto, you know that there were youths who died in the Warsaw Ghetto, and they were related to Tony. He had a grandfather who was from Warsaw. Some part of that family left, and other parts remained. It is the same story, in fact. It just so happens that his family got out, as people say now, in time. So this is Tony about himself. This is the early 80s in, in Atlanta. The most important and enduring consequence of my Atlanta sojourn was the visit of a Polish political sociologist, now historian Jan Gross, 
Because I was in the politics department at Oxford, I was assigned at Emory to the Department of Sociology as a visiting professor of political sociology. The dean of the faculty, anxious to improve the rather dowdy quality of the department, took the opportunity to put me on a search committee to replace a retiring political sociologist. Most of the applicants under consideration were generic clones of the Midwestern quantitative model in American sociology. That's how you can tell it's Tony, right? (laughs) And then there was Gross. Young was a political immigrant from Poland, forced into exile during the anti-Semitic campaign of 1968. He had completed a PhD at Yale, where he held his first academic position. I remember having read his book about German rule in wartime Poland, and immediately thought, this is the man. I managed to get him shortlisted along with three respectable but interchangeable political sociologists. So Young was invited to Atlanta and gave what must have seemed to his audience to be an almost entirely incomprehensible job talk. Galicia this, Valenia that, Belarus the other thing. Drawing on material from what would later become his classic study of the wartime Soviet annexation of Eastern Poland, a topic of no interest whatsoever to Emory's sociology department. He and I had dinner. We talked about solidarity, the labor union in communist Poland, a genuine mass movement that succeeded in attracting intellectual support from right and left alike that helped reintroduce Poland to the West. Young, like many others of the Polish generation of 1968, was in touch with intellectuals back in Poland and was actively engaged in interpreting Polish developments to Western audiences. I found the man and the subject altogether fascinating. In the course of that evening, I felt for the first time that my stay in Atlanta was not wasted. Far from having landed on planet Zerg, I was once again truly among people like me. Which meant Jan, it also meant Irena, who's here. Um, It meant a number of people who he met by way of Jan and Irena, all of whom led back to that other revolution of 1968, or most of whom, like Tony, were of Jewish origin, in a fairly interesting, um, if others if not to themselves, sort of way. So Tony found his way to a second sort of 20th century. The intellectual consequences of this are something like here. Okay, so later on in the book, there's a chapter about the resuscitation of liberalism, the sources of new kinds of liberalism in the second half of the 20th century, in the 70s, and in the 1980s. And we're shifting at this moment in the book from discussions of the Cold War liberals to what's going to happen after they begin to fade. So Tim asks, where is liberalism going to come from in the 1970s? Tony, from elsewhere, from people for whom liberalism remained a goal as yet unachieved people for whom the logic of a liberal state stood sharply opposed to that of their own rulers, intellectuals for whom liberalism had never been an uninterrogated default condition of politics, but rather a radical objective to be sought at considerable personal risk. By the 1970s, the most interesting liberal thought was in Eastern Europe. Despite their differences, Adamiknik in Poland, Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia, or the Hungarian liberals of their generation, all had something in common, lifelong experience with communism. In Eastern Europe, In Warsaw and Prague in the event, 1968 was thus not a revolt against the liberalism of the fathers, much less a protest about the mirage of political freedom. It was a revolt instead against the Stalinism of the 1960s generation's parents, a revolt often conducted under the guise and the name of reformed or restored Marxism. But the dream of Marxist revisionism was to fall beneath the police batons in Warsaw and the tanks in Prague. So what the liberals of East Central Europe had in common was a certain negative starting point. There is nothing to be gained from negotiating with authoritarian regimes, and so on. So you see there that the people he's talking about, police batons in Warsaw, tanks in Prague, are people to whom he hadn't paid any attention at the time in 1968 when he himself was protesting in Cambridge or Paris. The people he came to know along the way. They then inform not only the whole reading of European history, which makes post-war possible, as a book about both Eastern and Western European history, but they also resuscitate his own thinking about liberalism. He goes to Oxford and is influenced by the person who was their teacher in Warsaw, the Polish political philosopher, later historian of Marxism, Leszek Kłokowski. He goes to Oxford and becomes an intellectual, if not a personal disciple of Isaiah Berlin, with his notion of pluralism, which pretty much everyone in various ways among those East European liberals took for granted, one way or another, that there is not one right answer to political questions, that different kinds of epistemology, different kinds of ontology, different kinds of metaphysics, as well as different kinds of practice have to be there if you're going to respond. The answer to totalitarianism has to be some sort of plurality. That is a thought which Tony gets out of other people's experiences, but they are experiences which he comes to identify with as his own experiences, and they help him to come to a different kind of patchwork idea of liberalism. 
which leads him towards the social democracy, which he's eventually going to advocate, right? Which is a way to prop up liberalism. It's a way to sustain liberalism without fancy or coherent ideas. And social democracy without the Marxist telos becomes a way of, of preserving liberalism in the world. So I, I give this to you as an example of how the book operates as an argument, if you like. That there's something interesting both in Tony's life, the 1968 business, there's something interesting about the way life affects work, and it's not at all intuitive, that he identifies with someone else's 1968, and therefore broadens himself, which leads to something which is itself interesting, namely the ideas. If the book has an overall concern, the overall concern is, is with the state, and, and how one makes arguments like the one that I've just very, very briefly sketched about how the state can be sustained normatively as well as practically. We deal in the book, and I, I hope and I think we deal well with the history of fascism, anti-fascism, communism, anti-communism. But the conclusion towards which Tony was coming was that in some sense this was all a distraction. That one had to understand these things because they were still present in one form or another. History goes on. What one needed to do in the 20th century more, and what one still has to do in the 21st century, is make arguments that are just about the state, which somehow keep you away from these broader polemics, these broader two-sided arguments. That what was really at stake fundamentally was what the state could do, what the state couldn't do, the purposes of the state, the limits of the state, which is where I think he ended up. Let me read you one thing towards the very end about this. There's an obsession on both of our parts with Keynes and Hayek throughout the book. Almost regardless of what we're talking about, Keynes and Hayek turn up. Whether we're talking about Jews in Vienna or whether we're, whether we're talking about Marxism, Keynes and Hayek make appearances. Until we get to the point where I finally say, Tony, we've been talking about Hayek the whole time. Why is it that Hayek is so important? How could Hayek have been so important? We recite something we've recited a couple of times before, which is the history of Austria in the 1930s how precisely Hayekian prescriptions for economics made Austria into a Hitlerian disaster zone, how the Hayekian reading of history is actually 100% wrong. And therefore, among other things, we have to be more attentive to the Keynesian reading of how you think of economics as something which needs stability. So I, I mentioned the example of Hayek because we are not in this room or in Manhattan or in the state in general, but in general, we're in a moment of Hayekian hegemony in the United States of America, where everyone, even the Democrats, is working against this assumption that any intervention in the market inevitably leads to political authoritarianism, right? Whereas, in fact, if you pay attention to the history of ideas, you see that Hayek was generating a counter-ideology against other ideologies. And if you look at the history of history, you see that what Hayek was arguing has, in fact, been serially disproved. It's been disproved over and over and over again. This is Tim. Can we pause there for a moment? This has now come up more than once, and the whole Hayekian case seems like a historical misunderstanding that lies close to a debate that is absolutely crucial the whole century, and indeed to important debates which continue today. I find the historical origins of Hayek terribly puzzling. He was in Austria, where a conservative authoritarian Catholic state declared itself in favor of something called corporatism. This was a kind of pose which announced itself as political economy, but it had no political economy. Corporatism was the name of the state ideology, but corporatism in Austria was a partnership between government and various parts of society. There was very little in the way of interventionist fiscal or monetary policy. On the contrary, you see how I ramble on and the, you see the lack of question marks. On the contrary, the Austrians were incredibly conventional and strict in fiscal and monetary policy, just as Hayekians would recommend, which is why the country was hit so hard by the Depression and its governments were so helpless. It's also how they built up all their reserves in foreign currency and gold, which Hitler then took in 1938. So I've never really understood against what exactly Hayek was reacting. Austria was a politically authoritarian state, but it had no planning at all in a Keynesian sense. The Austrian experience actually seems to disprove Hayek's argument. If anything, a little planning would have helped the Austrian economy and made local authoritarianism and then Hitler, and all that followed from Hitler, less likely. Tony, I sympathize. <laughs> if you read The Road to Serfdom, you won't find much enlightenment on that score. But when you set Hayek's writing against Karl Popper's work of the same period, a pattern begins to emerge. What you see is a conflation of two animosities, dislike for the overconfident social democratic urban planning of the early 1920s Vienna, and distaste for the Christian social corporatist models that replaced them on the national level following the reactionary coup of 1934. In Austria, the Social Democrats and the Christian Socials, by this time gathered up in the, in the governing fatherland front, stood for very different constituencies and goals. Thus, any ostensible commonalities of rhetoric or program appear far more theoretical than historical. But from Hayek's point of view, and here he agrees with Popper and many other Austrian contemporaries, 
Both are responsible in their different ways for Austria's collapse into the arms of Nazi authoritarianism by 1938. Hayek is quite explicit on this point. If you begin with welfare policies of any sort, directing individuals, taxing for social ends, you will end up with Hitler. Not merely with social democratic housing projects or right-wing subsidies for honest wine growers, but Hitler. Thus, rather than run such a risk, democracy should avoid all forms of intervention which distort the properly apolitical mechanisms of the market economy. 10. The problem with such arguments made 50 or even 70 years on with reference to Hitler and such is they ignore so much the politics of Vienna or Austria in 1934, when democracy there was actually put to an end. These groups are supposedly are similar because of a general tendency towards government intervention or fighting a civil war against each other. And the great achievement read, read Vienna as being literally destroyed. Tony, shell by shell, 10, building by building, by artillery coming down from the hills around Vienna. Tony, this is the political autism of Hayek, manifest in that inability to distinguish the different politics that he didn't like one from the other, etc. The book turns out to be much more politically relevant at this particular moment than either of us, I think, could have expected when we finished it a couple of years ago. I leave the demonstration to the book itself. The book is much better than I could possibly be at presenting it because it's Tony's book. The book, though, as, as Jen says, I think does demonstrate the virtue of a couple of things. It demonstrates the virtue of concentration. It demonstrates the virtue of, of conversation. It demonstrates also the possibility, and this is something which Jenny said also in a different way in her article, it demonstrates the possibility of transcendence, not of the transcendence of death, which is of course impossible, but transcendence of the limits of life. The book was an act of transcending the kinds of limits we all faced, when we just faced them much, much, much more acutely. Nevertheless, he transcended them, wrote this book and two more books. But the striking thing about this, and what's ultimately interesting about this, is that that is the condition, Tony's health, Tony's dying, is the condition that permits this book. And it is not at all, not one little bit, not one breath, the subject of this book. It is what permitted this book to come about. The book is about the life of the mind. It's about the mindful life. That's what it's about. Thanks. This podcast was brought to you by the New York Institute for the Humanities and the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. You can find us on Stitcher, iTunes, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more information, visit us at nyihumanities.org.